Chapter One Shows How the Royal Family Sat Down to Breakfast. This is Valoroso twenty four, King of Paphlagonia, seated with his queen and only child at their royal breakfast table, and receiving the letter which announces to his majesty a proposed visit from Prince Bulbo, heir of Padella, reigning king of Crim Tartary. Remark the delight upon the monarch's royal features. He is so absorbed in the perusal of the king of Crim Tartary's letter that he allows his eggs to get cold, and leaves his august muffins untasted. "'What! That wicked, brave, delightful Prince Bulbo!' cries Princess Angelica. "'So handsome, so accomplished, so witty! The conqueror of Rimbombamento, where he slew ten thousand giants!' "'Who told you of him, my dear?' asks His Majesty. "'A little bird,' says Angelica. "'Poor Giglio,' says Mamma, pouring out the tea. "'Bother, Giglio!' cries Angelica, tossing up her head, which rustled with a thousand curl-papers. "'I wish,' growls the king, "'I wish Giglio was—' "'Was better?' "'Yes, dear, he is better,' says the queen. "'Angelica's little maid Betsinda told me so when she came to my room this morning with my early tea.' "'You are always drinking tea,' said the monarch, with a scowl. "'It is better than drinking port or brandy and water,' replies Her Majesty. "'Well, well, my dear, I only said you were fond of drinking tea,' said the King of Paphlagonia, with an effort as if to command his temper. "'Angelica, I hope you have plenty of new dresses. Your milliner's bills are long enough. My dear Queen, you must see and have some parties. I prefer dinners.' but of course you will be for balls. Your everlasting blue velvet quite tires me, and, my love, I should like you to have a new necklace. Order one. Not more than a hundred or a hundred and fifty thousand pounds. And Giglio, dear, says the Queen, Giglio may go to the— Oh, sir, screams Her Majesty, your own nephew, our late King's only son. Giglio may go to the tailor's, and order the bills to be sent in to Galumboso to pay, confound him. I mean, bless his dear heart. He need want for nothing. Give him a couple of guineas for pocket money, my dear, and you may as well order yourself some bracelets while you're about the necklace, Mrs. V. Her Majesty, or Mrs. V, as the monarch facetiously called her, for even royalty will have its sport, and this august family were very much attached, embraced her husband and twining her arm round her daughter's waist, they quitted the breakfast-room in order to make all things ready for the princely stranger. When they were gone, the smile that had lighted up the eyes of the husband and father fled. The pride of the king fled. The man was alone. Had I the pen of a G. P. R. James, I would describe Valoroso's torments in the choicest language, in which I would also depict his flashing eye, his distended nostril, his dressing-gown, pocket-handkerchief, and boots— but I need not say I have not the pen of that novelist. Suffice it to say, Valoroso was alone. He rushed to the cupboard, seizing from the table one of the many egg-cups with which his princely board was served for the matin meal, drew a bottle of right nance or cognac, filled and emptied the cup several times, and laid it down with a hoarse, Ha! 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 Now Valoroso is a man again. But, oh, he went on, still sipping, I am sorry to say, ere i was a king i needed not this intoxicating draught once i detested the hot brandy-wine and quaffed no other fount but nature's rill it dashes not more quickly o'er the rocks than i did as with blunderbuss in hand i brushed away the early morning dew and shot the partridge snipe or antlered deer ah well may england's dramatist remark uneasy lies the head that wears a crown why did I steal my nephews, my young Giglios? Steal? said I. No, 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 not steal, not steal. Let me withdraw that odious expression. I took, and on my manly head I set, the royal crown of Paphlagonia. I took, and with my royal arm I wield, the sceptral rod of Paphlagonia. I took, and in my outstretched hand I hold, the royal orb of Paphlagonia. Could a poor boy— a snivelling, drivelling boy, was in his nurse's arms but yesterday, and cried for sugar-plums, and pulled for pap. Bear up the awful weight of the crown, orb, sceptre, 
Gird on the sword my royal father's war, and meet in fight the tough Crimean foe. And then the monarch went on to argue in his own mind, though we need not say that blank verse is not argument, that what he had got it was his duty to keep, and that if at one time he had entertained ideas of a certain restitution, which shall be nameless, the prospect by a certain marriage of uniting two crowns and two nations which had been engaged in bloody and expensive wars, as the Paphlagonians and the Crimeans had been, put the idea of Giglio's restoration to the throne out of the question. Nay, were his own brother King Savio alive, he would certainly will the crown from his own son in order to bring about such a desirable union. Thus easily do we deceive ourselves, thus do we fancy what we wish is right. The king took courage, read the papers, finished his muffins and eggs, and rang the bell for his prime minister. The queen, after thinking whether she should go up and see Giglio, who had been sick, thought, Not now. Business first, pleasure afterwards. I will go and see dear Giglio this afternoon, and now I will drive to the jeweller's to look for the necklace and bracelets. The princess went up into her own room, and made Betsinda, her maid, bring out all her dresses, and as for Giglio, they forgot him, as much as I forget what I had for dinner last Tuesday twelvemonth. End of chapter 1